Chapter Twelve, Part Four of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume Four by Lewis Ginsburg. Chapter Twelve Satan Indicts the Jews. The position of the Jews after the royal edict became known beggar's description. If a Jew ventured abroad on the street to make a purchase, he was almost throttled by the Persians, who taunted him with these words, Never mind, to-morrow will soon be here, and then I shall kill thee, and take thy money away from thee. If a Jew offered to sell himself as a slave, he was rejected. Not even the sacrifice of his liberty could protect him against the loss of his life. Mordecai, however, did not despair. He trusted in the divine help. On his way from the court, after Haman and his ilk had informed him with malicious joy of the king's pleasure concerning the Jews, he met Jewish children coming from school. He asked the first child what verse from the scriptures he had studied in school that day, and the reply was, Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. The verse committed to memory by the second was, Let them take counsel together, but it shall be brought to naught. Let them speak the word, but it shall not stand, for God is with us and the verse which the third had learnt was, And even to old age I am he, and even to hoar hairs I will carry you. I have made and will bear, yea, I will carry and will deliver. When Mordecai heard these voices, he broke out into jubilation, astonishing Haman not a little. Mordecai told him, I rejoice at the good tidings announced to me by the school-children. Haman thereupon fell into such a rage that he exclaimed, In sooth they shall be the first to feel the weight of my hand. What gave Mordecai the greatest concern was the certainty that the danger had been invited by the Jews themselves, through their sinful conduct in connection with the banquets given by Ahasuerus. Eighteen thousand five hundred Jews had taken part in them. They had eaten and drunk, intoxicated themselves, and committed immoralities as Haman had foreseen. The very reason, indeed, he had advised the king to hold the banquets. Thereupon Satan had indicted the Jews. The accusations which he produced against them were of such a nature that God had once ordered writing materials to be brought to him for the decree of annihilation, and it was written and sealed. When the Torah heard that Satan's designs against the Jews had succeeded, she broke out into bitter weeping before God, and her lamentations awakened the angels, who likewise began to wail, saying, if Israel is to be destroyed, of what avail is the whole world? The sun and the moon heard the lamentations of the angels, and they donned their mourning garb, and also wept bitterly and wailed, saying, Is Israel to be destroyed? Israel who wanders from town to town, and from land to land, only for the sake of the study of the Torah? who suffers grievously under the hand of the heathen, only because he observes the Torah and the sign of the covenant? In great haste the prophet Elijah ran to the patriarchs, and to the other prophets, and to the saints in Israel, and addressed these words to them, O ye fathers of the world, angels, and the sun, and the moon, and heaven, and earth, and all the celestial hosts are weeping bitterly. The whole world is seized with throes as of a woman in travail, by reason of your children, who have forfeited their life on account of their sins, and ye sit quiet and tranquil. Thereupon Moses said to Elijah, Knowest thou any saints in the present generation of Israel? Elijah named Mordecai, and Moses sent the prophet to him 
with the charge that he the saint of the living generation should unite his prayers with the prayers of the saints among the dead and perhaps the doom might be averted from israel but elijah hesitated o faithful shepherd he said the edict of annihilation issued by god is written and sealed moses however did not desist he urged the patriarchs if the edict is sealed with wax your prayers will be heard if with blood then all is in vain elijah hastened to mordecai who when first he heard what god had resolved upon tore his garments and was possessed by a great fear though before he had confidently hoped that help would come from god he gathered together all the school children and had them fast so that their hunger should drive them to moan and groan then it was that israel spoke to god o lord of the world when the heathen rage against me they do not desire my silver and gold they desire only that i should be exterminated from off the face of the earth such was the design of nebuchadnezzar when he wanted to compel israel to worship the idol had it not been for hananiah michel and azariah i had disappeared from the world now it is haman who desires to uproot the whole vine then mordecai addressed all the people thus o people of israel that art so dear and precious in the sight of thy heavenly father knowest that not what has happened hast thou not heard that the king and haman have resolved to remove us off the face of the earth to destroy us from beneath the sun we have no king on whom we can depend and no prophet to intercede for us with prayers there is no place whither we can flee no land wherein we can find safety we are like sheep without a shepherd like a ship upon the sea without a pilot we are like an orphan born after the death of his father and death robs him of his mother too when he has scarce begun to draw nourishment from her breast after this address a great prayer meeting was called outside of shushan the ark containing the scroll of the law covered with sackcloth and strewn with ashes was brought thither the scroll was unrolled and the following verses read from it when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee in the latter days thou shalt return to the lord thy god and hearken unto his voice for the lord thy god is a merciful god he will not fail thee neither destroy thee nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swore unto them thereunto mordecai added words of admonition o people of israel thou art dear and precious to thy father in heaven let us follow the example of the inhabitants of nineveh doing as they did when the prophet jonah came to them to announce the destruction of the city the king arose from his throne laid his crown from him covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he made proclamation and published through nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water but let them be covered with sackcloth both man and beast and let them cry mightily unto god yea let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands then god repented him of the evil he had designed to bring upon them and he did it not now then let us follow their example let us hold a fast mayhap god will have mercy upon us furthermore spake mordecai o lord of the world didst thou not swear unto our fathers to make us as many as the stars in the heavens and now we are as sheep in the shambles what has become of thine oath he cried aloud though he knew god hears the softest whisper for he said o father of israel what hast thou done unto me one single cry of anguish uttered by esau thou didst repay with the blessing of his father isaac by thy sword shall thou live and now we ourselves are abandoned to the mercy of the sword 
what mordecai was not aware of was that he the descendant of jacob was brought unto weeping and wailing by haman the descendant of esau as a punishment because jacob himself had brought esau unto weeping and wailing the dream of mordecai fulfilled esther who knew naught of what was happening at court was greatly alarmed when her attendants told her that mordecai had appeared in the precincts of the palace clothed in sackcloth and ashes she was so overcome by fright that she was deprived of the joys of motherhood to which she had been looking forward with happy expectancy she sent clothes to mordecai who however refused to lay aside his garb of mourning until god permitted miracles to come to pass for israel wherein he followed the example of such great men in israel as jacob david and ahab and of the gentile inhabitants of nineveh at the time of jonah by no means would he array himself in court attire so long as his people were exposed to sure suffering the queen sent for daniel called also hathach in the scriptures and charged him to learn from mordecai wherefore he was mourning to escape all danger from spying ears hathach and mordecai had their conversation in the open like jacob when he consulted with his wives leah and rachel about leaving their father laban by hathach mordecai sent word to the queen that haman was an amalekite who like his ancestor sought to destroy israel he requested her to appear before the king and plead for the jews reminding her at the same time of a dream he had once had and told her about it once when mordecai had spent a long time weeping and lamenting over the misery of the jews in the dispersion and prayed fervently to god to redeem israel and rebuild the temple he fell asleep and in his sleep a dream visited him he dreamed he was transported to a desert place he had never seen before many nations lived there jumbled together only one small and despised nation kept apart at a short distance suddenly a snake shot up from the midst of the nations rising higher and higher and growing stronger and larger in proportion as it rose it darted in the direction of the spot in which the tiny nation stood and tried to protect itself upon it impenetrable clouds and darkness enveloped the little nation and when the snake was on the point of seizing it a hurricane arose from the four quarters of the world covering the snake as clothes cover a man and blew it to bits the fragments scattered hither and thither like chaff before the wind until not a speck of the monster was to be found anywhere then the cloud and the darkness vanished from above the little nation the splendor of the sun again enveloped it this dream mordecai recorded in a book and when the storm began to rage against the jews he thought of it and demanded that esther go to the king as the advocate of her people at first she did not feel inclined to accede to the wishes of mordecai by her messenger she recalled to his mind that he himself had insisted upon her keeping her jewish descent a secret besides she had always tried to refrain from appearing before the king at her own initiative in order that she might not be instrumental in bringing down sin upon her soul for she well remembered mordecai's teaching that a jewish woman captive among the heathen who of her own accord goes to them loses her portion in the jewish nation she had been rejoicing that her petitions had been granted and the king had not come nigh unto her this last month was she now voluntarily to present herself before him furthermore she had her messenger inform mordecai that haman had introduced a new palace regulation any one who appeared before the king without having been summoned by haman would suffer the death penalty therefore she could not if she would go to the king to advocate the cause of the jews esther urged her uncle to refrain from incensing haman 
and furnishing him with a pretext for wrecking the hatred of Esau to Jacob upon Mordecai and his nation. Mordecai, however, was firmly convinced that Esther was destined by God to save Israel. How could her miraculous history be explained otherwise? At the very moment Esther was taken to court, he had thought, Is it conceivable that God would force so pious a woman to wed with a heathen? Were it not that she is appointed to save Israel from menacing dangers? Firm as Mordecai was in his determination to make Esther take a hand in affairs, he yet did not find it a simple matter to communicate with her. For Hathach was killed by Haman as soon as it was discovered that he was acting as mediator between Mordecai and Esther. There was none to replace him. Unto God dispatched the archangels Michael and Gabriel to carry messengers from one to the other and back again. Mordecai sent word to her, if she let the opportunity to help Israel slip by, she would have to give account for the omission before the heavenly court. To Israel in distress, however, help would come from other quarters. Never had God forsaken his people in time of need. Moreover, he admonished her that, as the descendant of Saul, it was her duty to make reparation for her ancestor's sin in not having put Agag to death. Had he done as he was bidden, the Jews would not now have to fear the machinations of Haman, the offspring of Agag. He bade her supplicate her heavenly father to deal with the present enemies of Israel, as he had dealt with his enemies in former ages. To give her encouragement, Mordecai continued, Is Haman so surpassing great that his plan against the Jews must succeed? Does thou mean to say that he is superior to his own ancestor Amalek, whom God crushed when he precipitated himself upon Israel? Is he mightier than the thirty-one kings who fought against Israel, and whom Joshua slew with the word of God? Is he stronger than Sisera, who went out against Israel with nine hundred iron chariots, and yet met his death? at the hands of a mere woman, the punishment for having withdrawn the use of the water springs from the Israelites and prevented their wives from taking the prescribed ritual baths, and thus from fulfilling their conjugal duty? Is he more powerful than Goliath, who reviled the warriors of Israel and was slain by David? Or is he more invincible than the sons of Orpah, who waged wars with Israel? and were killed by David and his men. Therefore, do not refrain thy mouth from prayer, and thy lips from supplication, for on account of the merits of our fathers, Israel has ever and ever been snatched out of the jaws of death. He who has at all times done wonders for Israel will deliver the enemy into our hands now, for us to do with him as seemeth best to us. What he endeavored to impress upon Esther particularly was that God would bring help to Israel without her intermediation, but it was to her interest to use the opportunity for which alone she had reached her exalted place, to make up for the transgressions committed by her house, Saul and his descendants. Yielding at last to the arguments of Mordecai, Esther was prepared to risk life in this world in order to secure life in the world to come. She made only one request of her uncle. He was to have the Jews spend three days in prayer and fasting in her behalf, that she might find favor in the eyes of the king. At first Mordecai was opposed to the proclamation of a fast, because it was Passover time, and the law prohibits fasting on the holidays. But he finally assented to Esther's reasoning. Of what avail are the holidays if there is no Israel to celebrate them? And without Israel there would not be even a Torah. Therefore it is advisable to transgress on law that God may have mercy upon us. THE PRAYER OF ESTHER Accordingly, Mordecai made arrangements for a fast and a prayer meeting. On the very day of the festival, he had himself ferried across the water to the other side of Shushan, 
where all the Jews of the city could observe the fast together. It was important that the Jewish residents of Shushan, beyond all other Jews, should do penance and seek pardon from God, because they had committed the sin of partaking of Ahasuerus's banquet. Twelve thousand priests marched in the procession, trumpets in their right hands, and the holy scrolls of their law in their left, weeping and mourning and exclaiming against God, Here is the Torah thou gavest us. Thy beloved people is about to be destroyed. When that comes to pass, who will be left to read the Torah and make mention of thy name? The sun and the moon will refuse to shed their light abroad, for they were created only for the sake of Israel. Then they fell upon their faces and said, Answer us, our father, answer us, our king. The whole people joined in their cry, and the celestials wept with them, and the fathers came forth from their graves. After a three days fast, Esther arose from the earth and dust, and made preparations to betake herself to the king. She arrayed herself in a silken garment, embroidered with gold from Ophir, and spangled with diamonds and pearls sent her from Africa. A golden crown was on her head, and on her feet shoes of gold. After she had completed her attire, she pronounced the following prayer, Thou art the great God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of my father Benjamin. Not because I consider myself without blemish do I dare appear before the foolish king, but that the people of Israel may not be cut off from the world. Is it not for the sake of Israel alone that the whole world was created? And if Israel should cease to exist, who will come and exclaim, Holy, 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 thrice daily before thee? As thou didst save Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah out of the burning furnace, and Daniel out of the den of lions, so save me out of the hand of this foolish king and make me to appear charming and graceful in his eyes. I entreat thee to give ear to my prayer in this time of exile and banishment from our land. By reason of our sins, the threatening words of the Holy Scriptures are accomplished upon us. Ye shall sell yourselves unto your enemies for bondmen and for bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. The decree to kill us has been issued. We are delivered up unto the sword for destruction, root and branch. The children of Abraham covered themselves with sackcloth and ashes. But though the elders sinned, what wrongs have the children committed? And though the children committed wrongs, what have the sucklings done? The nobles of Jerusalem came forth from their graves, for their children were given up to the sword. How quickly had the days of our joy flown by! The wicked Haman has surrendered us to our enemies for slaughter. I will recount before thee the deeds of thy friends, and with Abraham will I begin. Thou didst try him with all temptations, yet didst thou find him faithful. O oh, that thou wouldst support his beloved children for his sake, and aid them, so that thou wouldst bear them as an unbreakable seal upon thy right hand. Call Haman to account for the wrong he would do us, and be revenged upon the son of Hamadatha. Demand requital of Haman, and not of thy people, for he sought to annihilate us all at one stroke. He, the enemy and afflictor of thy people, whom he endeavors to hem in on all sides. With an eternal bond thou didst bind us unto thee. O oh, that thou would uphold us for the sake of Isaac, who was bound, Haman offered the king ten thousand talents of silver for us. Raise thou our voice, and answer us, and bring us forth out of the narrow place into enlargement. Thou who breakest the mightiest, crush Haman, so that he may never again rise from his fall. I am ready to appear before the king, to entreat grace for my inheritance. Send thou an angel of compassion with me on mine errand, and let grace and favor be my companions. May the righteousness of Abraham go before me, the binding of Isaac raise me, the charm of Jacob be put into my mouth, 
and the grace of Joseph upon my tongue. Happy the man who putteth his trust in God. He is not confounded. He will lend me his right hand and his left hand, with which he created the whole world. Ye, all ye of Israel, pray for me, as I pray in your behalf. For whatsoever a man may ask of God in the time of his distress is granted unto him. Let us look upon the deeds of our fathers, and do like unto them, and he will answer our supplications. The left hand of Abraham held Isaac by the throat, and his right hand grasped the knife. He willingly did thy bidding, nor did he delay to execute thy command. Heaven opened its windows to give space to the angels, who cried bitterly, and said, Woe to the world if this thing should come to pass! I also call upon thee, O answer me, for thou givest ear unto all who are afflicted and oppressed. Thou art called the merciful and the gracious. Thou art slow to anger and great in loving kindness and truth. Hear our voice and answer us, and lead us out of distress into enlargement. For three days have I fasted, in accordance with the number of days Abraham journey, to bind his son upon the altar before thee. Thou didst make a covenant with him, and didst promise him, Whenever thy children shall be in distress, I will remember the binding of Isaac favorably unto them, and deliver them out of their troubles. Again I fasted three days, corresponding to the three classes Israel, priests, Levites, and Israelites, who stood at the foot of Sinai and said, All the Lord hath spoken will we do, and be obedient. Esther concluded her prayer and said, O God, Lord of hosts, thou that searchest the heart and the reins, in this hour do thou remember the merits of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that my petition to thee not be turned aside, nor my request be left unfulfilled. Esther intercedes. After finishing her prayer, Esther betook herself to the king, accompanied by three attendants, one walking to the right of her, the second on the other side, and the third bearing her train, heavy with the precious stones with which it was studded. Her chief adornment was the Holy Spirit that was poured out over her. But scarcely did she enter the chamber containing the idols when the Holy Spirit departed from her, and she cried out in great distress, Eli, Eli, lama zabachthani! Shall I be chastened for acts that I do against my will, and only in obedience to the promptings of sore need? Why should my fate be different from that of the mother? When Pharaoh only attempted to approach Sarah, plagues came upon him and his house. But I have been compelled for years to live with this heathen, and thou dost not deliver me out of his hand. O Lord of the world, have I not paid scrupulous heed to the three commands thou didst specifically ordain for women? To reach the king, Esther had to pass through seven apartments, each measuring ten ells in length. The first three she traversed unhindered. They were too far off for the king to observe her progress through them. But barely had she crossed the threshold of the fourth chamber when Ahasuerus caught sight of her, and, overcome by rage, he exclaimed, O oh, for the departed! Their like is not found again on earth! How I urged and entreated Vashti to appear before me! But she refused, and I had her killed, therefore. This Esther come hither without invitation, like unto a public prostitute! In consternation and despair, Esther stood rooted to the centre of the fourth chamber, Having once allowed her to pass through the doors under their charge, the guards of the first four rooms had forfeited their authority over her, and to the guards in the other three rooms she had not yet given cause for interfering with her. Yet the courtiers were so confident that Esther was about to suffer the death penalty that the sons of Haman were already busy dividing her jewels among themselves and casting lots for her royal purple. Esther herself was keenly aware of her dangerous position. 
in her need she besought god eli eli lama azbatani she prayed to him the words which have found their place in the psalter composed by king david because she put her confidence in god he answered her petition and sent her three angels to help her the one enveloped her countenance with the threads of grace the second raised her head and the third drew out the sceptre of ahasuerus until it touched her the king turned his head round to avoid seeing esther but the angels forced him to look her way and be conquered by her seductive charm by reason of her long fast esther was so weak that she was unable to extend her hand toward the scepter of the king the archangel michael had to draw her near it ahasuerus then said i see thou must have a most important request to prefer else thou hast not risked thy life deliberately i am ready to give it thee even to the half of the kingdom there is but one petition i cannot grant and that is the restoration of the temple i gave my oath to geshem the arabian sanballat the horonite and tobiah the ammonite not to allow it to be rebuilt from fear of the jews lest they rise up against me for the moment esther refrained from uttering her petition all she asked was that the king and haman would come to a banquet she proposed to give she had good reasons for this peculiar course of conduct she desired to disarm haman's suspicions regarding her jewish descent and to lead her fellow jews to fix their hope upon god and not upon her at the same time it was her plan to arouse jealousy of haman in both the king and the princess she was quite ready to sacrifice her own life if her stratagems would but involve the life of haman too at the banquet she therefore favored haman in such manner that ahasuerus could not but be jealous she moved her chair close to haman's and when ahasuerus handed her his wine cup to let her drink of it first she passed it on to his minister after the banquet the king repeated his question and again made the asseveration that he would fulfil her wishes at whatever cost barring only the restoration of the temple esther however was not yet ready she preferred to wait another day before taking up the conflict with haman she had before her eyes the example of moses who also craved a day's preparation before going out against the amalek the ancestor of haman deceived by the attention and distinction accorded him by esther haman felt secure in his position priding himself not only on the love of the king but also on the respect of the queen he felt himself to be the most privileged being in all the wide realm governed by ahasuerus filled with arrogant self-sufficiency he passed by mordecai who not only refused to give him the honors decreed in his behalf but besides pointed to his knee inscribed with the bill of sale whereby haman had become the slave of mordecai doubly and triply enraged he resolved to make an example of the jew but he was not satisfied with inflicting death by a simple kick on reaching his home he was disappointed not to find his wife zerush the daughter of the persian satrap tatanai as always when haman was at court she had gone to her paramours he sent for her and his three hundred and sixty-five advisers and with them he took counsel as to what was to be done to mordecai pointing to a representation of his treasure chamber which he wore on his bosom he said and all this is worthless in my sight when i look upon mordecai the jew what i eat and drink loses its savour if i but think of him among his advisers and sons of whom there were two hundred and eight none was so clever as zerush his wife she spoke thus if the man thou tellest of is a jew thou wilt not be able to do aught to him except by sagacity if thou casteth him into the fire 
it will have no effect upon him for hananiah mishael and azariah escaped from the burning furnace unhurt joseph went free from prison manasseh prayed to god and he heard him and saved him from the iron furnace to drive him out in the wilderness is useless thou knowest the desert did no evil to the israelites that passed through it putting out his eyes avail naught for samson blind did more mischief than ever samson seeing therefore hang him for no jew has ever escaped death by hanging haman was well pleased with the words of his wife she fetched artificers in wood and iron the former to erect the cross the latter to make the nails their children danced around in high glee while zerush played upon the cithern and haman in his pleasurable excitement said to the woodworkers i shall give abundant pay and the iron workers i shall invite to a banquet when the cross was finished haman himself tested it to see that all was in working order a heavenly voice was heard it is good for haman the villain and for the son of hamadatha it is fitting End of chapter 12, part 4. Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana. Chapter 12, part 5 of the Legends of the Jews, volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, volume 4. By Lewis Ginsburg. Chapter 12 The Disturbed Night. The night during which Haman erected the cross for Mordecai was the first night of Passover, the very night in which miracles without number had ever been done for the fathers and for Israel. But this time the night of joy was changed into a night of mourning and a night of fears. Wherever there were Jews, they passed the night in weeping and lamenting. The greatest terrors it held for Mordecai, because his own people accused him of having provoked their misfortunes by his haughty behavior toward Haman. Excitement and consternation reigned in heaven as well as on earth. When Haman had satisfied himself that the cross intended for his enemy was properly constructed, he repaired to the Bet Hamidrish, where he found Mordecai and all the Jewish school children, twenty two thousand in number, in tears and sorrow. He ordered them to be put in chains, saying, First I shall kill off these, and then I shall hang Mordecai. The mothers hastened thither with bread and water, and coaxed their children to take something before they had to encounter death. The children, however, laid their hands upon their books and said as our teacher mordecai liveth we will neither eat nor drink but we will perish exhausted with fasting they rolled up their sacred scrolls and handed them to their teachers with the words for our devotion to the study of the torah we had hoped to be rewarded with long life according to the promised held out in the holy scriptures as we are not worthy thereof remove the books the outcries of the children and of the teachers in the Bet Hamidras, and the weeping of the mothers without, united with the supplications of the fathers, reached unto heaven in the third hour of the night, and God said, I hear the voice of tender lambs and sheep. Moses arose and addressed God thus, Thou knowest well that the voices are not of lambs and sheep, but of the young of Israel who for three days have been fasting and languishing in fetters only to be slaughtered on the morrow to the delight of the arch enemy then god felt compassion with israel for the sake of his innocent little ones he broke the seal with which the heavenly decree of annihilation had been fastened and the decree itself he tore in pieces from this moment on ahasuerus became restless and sleep was made to flee his eyes for the purpose that the redemption of israel might be brought to pass god sent down michael the leader of the hosts of israel 
who was to keep sleep from the king. And the archangel Gabriel descended, and threw the king out of his bed on the floor, no less than three hundred and sixty-five times, continually whispering in his ear, O thou ingrate, reward him who deserves to be rewarded. To account for his sleeplessness, Ahasuerus thought he might have been poisoned, and he was about to order the execution of those charged with the preparation of his food. But they succeeded in convincing him of their innocence, by calling to his attention that Esther and Haman had shared his evening meal with him, yet they felt no unpleasant effects. Then suspicions against his wife and his friend began to arise in his mind. He accused them inwardly of having conspired together to put him out of the way. He sought to banish this thought with the reflection, that if a conspiracy had existed against him, his friends would have warned him of it. But the reflection brought others in its train. Did he have any friends? Was it not possible that by leaving valuable services unrewarded he had forfeited the friendly feelings toward him? He thenceforth commanded that the chronicles of the kings of Persia be read to him. He would compare his own acts with what his predecessors had done, and try to find out whether he might count upon friends. What was read to him did not restore his tranquillity of mind, for he saw a poor man before him, none other than the angel Michael, who called to him continually, Haman wants to kill thee, and become king in thy stead. Let this serve thee as proof that I am telling thee the truth. Early in the morning he will appear before thee, and request permission of thee to kill him who saved thy life. And when thou inquirest of him what honor should be done to him, whom the king delighteth to honor, he will ask to be given the apparel, the crown, and the horse of the king, as signs of distinction. Ahasuerus' excitement was soothed only when the passage in the Chronicles was reached describing the loyalty of Mordecai. Had the wishes of the reader been consulted, Ahasuerus had never heard this entry, for it was a son of Haman who was filling the office of reader, and he was desirous of passing the incident over in silence. But a miracle occurred, the words were heard, though they were not uttered. The names of Mordecai and Israel had a quieting influence upon the king, and he dropped asleep. He dreamed that Haman, sword in hand, was approaching him with evil intent, and when, early in the morning, Haman suddenly, without being announced, entered the antechamber and awakened the king, Ahasuerus was persuaded of the truth of his dream. The king was still further set against Haman by the reply he gave to the question how honor was to be shown to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Believing himself to be the object of the king's good will, he advised Ahasuerus to have his favorite arrayed in the king's coronation garments, and the crown royal put upon his head. Before him, one of the grandees of the kingdom was to run, doing herald's service, proclaiming that whosoever did not prostrate himself and bow down before him whom the king delighteth to honor, would have his head cut off, and his house given over to pillage. Haman was quick to notice that he had made a mistake, for he saw the king's countenance change color at the mention of the word crown. He therefore took good care not to refer to it again. In spite of this precaution, Ahasuerus saw in the words of Haman a striking verification of his vision, and he was confident that Haman cherished designs against his life and his throne. THE FALL OF HAMAN Haman was soon to find out that he had gone far afield in supposing himself to be the man whom the king delighted to honor. The king's command ran, Hasten to the royal treasure chambers, fetch thence a cover of fine purple, a raiment of delicate silk, furnished forth with golden bells and pomegranates, and bestrewn with diamonds and pearls, and the large golden crown which was brought me from Macedonia upon the day I ascended the throne. Furthermore, 
fetch thence the sword and the coat of mail sent me from ethiopia and the two veils embroidered with pearls which were africa's gift then repair to the royal stables and lead forth the black horse whereon i sat at my coronation with all these insignia of honor seek out mordecai haman which mordecai ahasuerus mordecai the jew haman there be many jews named mordecai ahasuerus the jew mordecai who sits at the king's gate haman there be many royal gates i know not which thou meanest ahasuerus the gate that leads from the harem to the palace haman this man is my enemy and the enemy of my house rather would i give him ten thousand talents of silver than do him this honor ahasuerus ten thousand talents of silver shall be given him and he shall be made lord over thy house but these honors must thou show unto him haman i have ten sons i would rather have them run before his horse than do him this honor ahasuerus thou thy sons and thy wife shall be slaves to mordecai but these honors must thou show unto him haman o my lord and king mordecai is a common man appoint him to be ruler over a city or if thou wilt even over a district rather than i should do him this honor ahasuerus i will appoint him ruler over cities and districts all the kings on land and on water shall pay him obedience but these honors must thou show unto him haman rather have coins struck bearing thy name together with his instead of mine as hitherto than i should do him this honor ahasuerus the man who saved the life of the king deserves to have his name put on the coin of the realm nevertheless these honors must thou show unto him haman edicts and writings have been issued to all parts of the kingdom commanding that the nation to which mordecai belongs shall be destroyed recall them rather than i should do him this honor ahasuerus the edicts and writings shall be recalled yet these honors must thou show unto mordecai seeing that all petitions and entreaties were ineffectual and ahasuerus insisted upon the execution of his order haman went to the royal treasure chambers walking with his head bowed like a mourner's his ears hanging down his eyes dim his mouth screwed up his heart hardened his bowels cut in pieces his loins weakened and his knees knocking against each other he gathered together the royal insignia and took them to mordecai accompanied on his way by harbona and abzor who at the order of the king were to take heed whether haman carried out his wishes to the letter when mordecai saw his enemy approach he thought his last moment had come he urged his pupils to flee that they might not burn themselves with his coals but they refused saying in life as in death we desire to be with thee the few moments left him as he thought mordecai spent in devotion with words of prayer on his lips he desired to pass away haman therefore had to address himself to the pupils of mordecai what was the last subject taught you by your teacher mordecai they told him they had been discussing the law of the omer the sacrifice brought on that very day so long as the temple had stood at his request they described some of the details of the ceremony in the temple connected with the offering he exclaimed happy are you that your ten farthings with which you bought the wheat for the omer produced a better effect than my ten thousand talents of silver which i offered unto the king for the destruction of the jews meantime mordecai had finished his prayer haman stepped up to him and said arise thou pious son of abraham isaac and jacob thy sackcloth and ashes availed more than my ten thousand talents of silver which i promised unto the king they were not accepted but thy prayers were accepted by thy father in heaven mordecai 
not yet disabused of the notion that Haman had come to take him to the cross, requested the grace of a few minutes for his last meal. Only Haman's repeated protests assured him. When Haman set about arraying him with the royal apparel, Mordecai refused to put it on until he had bathed and had dressed his hair. Royal apparel agreed, but ill with his condition after three days of sackcloth and ashes. As luck would have it, Esther had issued the command that the bath-keepers and barbers were not to ply their trades on that day, and there was nothing for Haman to do but perform the menial services Mordecai requested. Haman tried to play upon the feelings of Mordecai. Fetching a deep sigh, he said, The greatest in the king's realm is now acting as bath-keeper and barber. Mordecai, however, did not permit himself to be imposed upon. He knew Haman's origin too well to be deceived. He remembered his father, who had been bath-keeper and barber in a village. Haman's humiliation was not yet complete. Mordecai, exhausted by his three days' fast, was too weak to mount his horse unaided. Haman had to serve him as footstool, and Mordecai took the opportunity to give him a kick. Haman reminded him of the scriptural verse, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he is overthrown. Mordecai, however, refused to apply it to himself, for he was chastening, not a personal enemy, but the enemy of his people, and of such it is said in the scriptures, and thou shalt tread upon the high places of thine enemies. Finally, Haman caused Mordecai to ride through the streets of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. In front of them marched twenty-seven thousand youths detailed for this service from the court. In their right hands they bore golden cups, and golden beakers in their left hands, and they too proclaimed, Thus shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. The procession, furthermore, was swelled by the presence of Jews. They, however, made a proclamation of different tenor. Thus shall be done, they cried out, unto the man whose honor is desired by the king, that hath created heaven and earth. As he rode along, Mordecai gave praise to God, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast raised me up, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from Sheol, thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit, whereupon his pupils joined in with, Sing praise unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, in his favor is life, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Haman added the verse thereto, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Thou, Lord, of thy favor hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face. I was troubled. Queen Esther continued, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? And the whole concourse of Jews present cried out, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee for ever. When this procession passed the house of Haman, his daughter was looking out of the window. She took the man on the horse to be her father, and the leader of it, Mordecai. Raising a vessel filled with offal, she emptied it out over the leader, her own father. Scarce had the vessel left her hand, when she realized the truth, and she threw herself from the window, and lay crushed to death on the street below. In spite of the sudden change in his fortunes, Mordecai ended the eventful day as he had begun it, in prayer and fasting. No sooner was the procession over 
than he put off the royal robes, and again covering himself with sackcloth, he prayed until night fell. Haman was plunged in mourning, partly on account of the deep disgrace to which he had been subjected, partly on account of the death of his daughter. Neither his wife nor his friends could advise him how to mend his sad fortunes. They could hold out only sorry consolation to him. If this Mordecai is of the seed of the saints, thou wilt not be able to prevail against him. Thou wilt surely encounter the same fate as the kings in their battle with Abraham, and Abimelech in his quarrel with Isaac. As Jacob was victorious over the angel with whom he wrestled, and Moses and Aaron caused the drowning of Pharaoh and his host, so Mordecai will overcome thee in the end. While they were yet talking, the king's chamberlains came, and hastily carried Haman off to the banquet Esther had prepared, to prevent him and his influential sons from plotting against the king. Ahasuerus repeated his promise to give Esther whatever she desired, always expecting the restoration of the temple. This time, casting her eyes heavenward, Esther replied, If I have found favor in thy sight, O supreme king, and if it please thee, O king of the world, let my life be given me, and let my people be rescued out of the hands of its enemy. Ahasuerus, thinking these words were addressed to him, asked in irritation, Who is he, and where is he, this presumptuous conspirator who thought to do thus? These were the first words the king had ever spoken to Esther herself. Hitherto, he had always communicated with her through an interpreter. He had not quite been satisfied she was worthy enough to be addressed by the king. Now, made cognizant of the fact that she was a Jewess, and of royal descent besides, he spoke to her directly, without the intervention of others. Esther stretched forth her hand to indicate the man who had sought to take her life, as he had actually taken Vashti's but in the excitement of the moment she pointed to the king. Fortunately, the king did not observe her error, because an angel guided her hand instantaneously in the direction of Haman, whom her words described, This is the adversary, and the enemy, he who desired to murder thee in thy sleeping chamber during the night just past, he who this very day desired to array himself in the royal apparel, ride upon thy horse, and wear thy golden crown upon his head, to rise up against thee, and deprive thee of thy sovereignty. But God set his undertaking at naught, and the honors he sought for himself fell to the share of my uncle Mordecai, who this oppressor and enemy thought to hang. The anger of the king already burnt so fiercely that he hinted to Esther that whether Haman was the adversary she had in mind or not, she was to designate him as such. To infuriate him still more, God sent ten angels in the guise of Haman's ten sons to fell down the trees in the royal park. When Ahasuerus turned his eyes toward the interior of the park, he saw the ruthless destruction of which they were guilty. In his rage he went out into the garden. This was the instant utilized by Haman to implore grace for himself from Esther. Gabriel intervened, and threw Haman upon the couch in a posture as though he were about to do violence to the queen. At that moment Ahasuerus reappeared, enraged beyond description by what he saw. He cried out, Haman attempts the honor of the queen in my very presence? Come then, ye peoples, nations, and races, and pronounced judgment over him. When Harbonah, originally a friend of Haman and an adversary of Mordecai, heard the king's angry exclamation, he said to him, Nor is this the only crime committed by Haman against thee, for he was an accomplice of the conspirators Bictha and Teresh, and his enmity to Mordecai dates back to the time when Mordecai uncovered their foul plots. Out of revenge, therefore, he has erected a cross for him. Harbonah's words illustrate the saying, Once the ox has been cast to the ground, slaughtering knives can readily be found. Knowing that Haman had fallen from his high estate, Harbonah was intent upon winning the friendship of Mordecai. 
Harbana was altogether right, for Ahasuerus at once ordered Haman to be hanged. Mordecai was charged with the execution of the king's order, and Haman's tears and entreaties did not in the least move him. He insisted upon hanging him like the commonest of criminals, instead of executing him with the sword, the mode of punishment applied to men of rank guilty of serious misdemeanors. The cross which Haman, at the advice of his wife Zerush, and of his friends, had erected for Mordecai, was now used for himself. It was made of wood from a thorn-bush. God called all the trees together, and inquired which one would permit the cross for Haman to be made of. The fig-tree said, I am ready to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel, and also my fruits were brought to the temple as first-fruits. The vine said, I am ready to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel, and also my wine is brought to the altar. The apple-tree said, I am ready to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel. The nut-tree said, I am ready to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel. The etrog tree said, I should have the privilege, for with my fruit Israel praises God on Sukkot. The willow of the brook said, I desire to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel. The cedar tree said, I desire to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel. The palm tree said, I desire to serve, for I am symbolic of Israel. Finally, the thorn bush came and said, I am fitted to do this service, for the ungodly are like pricking thorns. The offer of the thorn bush was accepted, after God gave a blessing to each of the other trees for its willingness to serve. A sufficiently long beam cut from a thorn bush could be found only in the house of Haman, which had to be demolished in order to obtain it. The cross was tall enough for Haman and his ten sons to be hanged upon it. It was planted three cubits deep in the ground. Each of the victims required three cubits space in length. One cubit space was left vacant between the feet of the one above and the head of the one below. And the youngest son, Vizatha, had his feet four cubits from the ground as he hung. Haman and his ten sons remained suspended a long time to the vexation of those who considered it a violation of the biblical prohibition in Deuteronomy not to leave a human body hanging upon a tree overnight. Esther pointed to a precedent, the descendants of Saul, whom the Gibeonites left hanging half a year, whereby the name of God was sanctified. For whenever the pilgrims beheld them, they told the heathen that the men had been hanged because their father Saul had laid hand on the Gibeonites. How much more, then, continued Esther, are we justified in permitting Haman and his family to hang, they who desired to destroy the house of Israel? Beside these ten sons, who had been governors in various provinces, Haman had twenty others, ten of whom died, and the other ten of whom were reduced to beggary. The vast fortune of which Haman died, possessed, was divided in three parts. The first part was given to Mordecai and Esther, the second to the students of the Torah, and the third was applied to the restoration of the temple. Mordecai thus became a wealthy man. He was also set up as king of the Jews. As such he had coins struck, which bore the figure of Esther on the obverse, and his own figure on the reverse. However, in the measure in which Mordecai gained in worldly power and consideration, he lost spiritually because the business connected with his high political station left him no time for the study of the Torah. Previously he had ranked sixth among the eminent scholars of Israel. He now dropped to the seventh place among them. Ahasuerus, on the other hand, was the gainer by the change. As soon as Mordecai entered upon the office of Grand Chancellor, he succeeded in subjecting to his sway the provinces that had revolted on account of Vashti's execution. THE EDICT OF THE KING The edict issued against the Jews was revoked by Ahasuerus in the following terms. King Ahasuerus sends this letter to all the inhabitants of water and earth, to all the rulers of districts, and to generals of the army, who dwell in every country. May your peace be great. 
I write this to you to inform you that although I rule over many nations, over the inhabitants of land and sea, yet I am not proud of my power, but will rather walk in lowliness and meekness of spirit all my days, in order to provide for you great peace. Unto all who dwell under my dominion, unto all who seek to carry on business on land or on sea, unto all who desire to export goods from one nation to the other, from one people to the other unto them all, I am the same, from one end of the earth to the other. And none may seek to cause excitement on land or on sea, or enmities between one nation and another, between one people and another. I write this, because in spite of our sincerity and honesty with which we love all the nations, revere all the rulers, and do good to all the potentates, there are nevertheless people who were near to the king, and into whose hand the government was entrusted, who by their intrigues and falsehoods misled the king, and wrote letters which are not right before heaven, which are evil before men, and harmful for the empire. This was the petition they requested from the king, that righteous men should be killed, and most innocent blood be shed, of those who have not done any evil, nor were guilty of death, such righteous people as Esther, celebrated for all virtues, and Mordecai, wise in every branch of wisdom. There is no blemish to be found in them, nor in their nation. I thought that I was requested concerning another nation, and did not know it was concerning the Jews, who were called the children of the Lord of all, who created heaven and earth, and who led them and their fathers through great and mighty empires. And now as he, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, from Judea, a descendant of Amalek, who came to us, and enjoyed much kindness, praise, and dignity from us, whom we made great, and called Father of the King, and seated him at the right of the king, did not know how to appreciate the dignity, and how to conduct the affairs of state, but harbored thoughts to kill the king, and take away his kingdom. Therefore we ordered the son of Habadatha to be hanged, and all that he desired we have brought upon his head, and the Creator of heaven and earth brought his machinations upon his head. As a memorial of the wonderful deliverance from the hands of Haman, the Jews of Shushan celebrated the day their arch-enemy had appointed for their extermination, and their example was followed by the Jews of the other cities of the Persian Empire, and by those of other countries. Yet the sages, when besought by Esther, refused at first to make it a festival for all times, lest the hatred of the heathen be excited against the Jews. They yielded, only after Esther had pointed out to them that the events on which the holiday was based were perpetuated in the annuals of the kings of Persia and Media, and thus the outside world would not be able to misinterpret the joy of the Jews. Esther addressed another petition to the sages. She begged that the book containing her history should be incorporated in the Holy Scriptures, because they shrank from adding anything to the triple canon, consisting of the Torah, the Prophets, and the Hagiographia, they again refused, and again they had to yield to Esther's argument. She quoted the words from Exodus, Write this for a memorial in a book, spoken by Moses to Joshua, after the battle of Rephidim with the Amalekites. They saw that it was the will of God to immortalize the warfare waged with the Amalekite haven nor is the book of Esther an ordinary history. Without aid of the Holy Spirit, it could not have been composed, and therefore its canonization, resolved upon below, was endorsed above. And as the book of Esther became an integral and indestructible part of the Holy Scriptures, so the Feast of Purim will be celebrated forever, now and in the future world, and Esther herself, by her pious deeds, acquired a good name both in this world and in the world to come. End of chapter 12 End of the Legends of the Jews, Volume 4, Bible Times and Characters 
from joshua to esther by rabbi lewis ginsburg recording by scarlet louisiana